Thank you. My, uh, my sincere apologies to all of you that the night has dragged on so long, and you honor me with your presence tonight. I know it's been a long day for all of us, and it's been a difficult day, an emotional day, as we think about the difficult issues that are before us. Let me say just a couple words before I begin. Many of you ask of my life and the life of my family often when I see you. And so let me give you a quick update on my family. I'm blessed to have a 20-year-old daughter that you know as Angela. Many of you have met her over the years. And Angela is a junior at college at Taylor University, studying with a goal in mind of coming back to Chicago and being a Chicago public school teacher. She makes her dad proud. And she'll stand up. Andrew, my 17-year-old son, a senior in high school, is home preparing tomorrow to play in the semifinals of a football game for the, city, for the state championship at the state of Illinois. Today, in the Chicago Sun-Times, newspaper of the city of Chicago, there is a major article about my son Andrew. I want to read you just the first line. It's a fairly lengthy article in a Chicago paper. It says, Naperville North wide receiver Andrew Gordon has never forgotten the education and human relations that he received while growing up in Lawndale, the Lawndale community on Chicago's west side. And he, after he finds his niche in life, he vows to go back and help others. The article begins with that. Andrew will be playing. Tomorrow it's not my custom to leave early, but I will, Ann and I and Angela will be leaving the CCDA conference early tomorrow so that we might get back to Illinois to watch our son Andrew play football. My wife, Ann, continues to stand tall in the kingdom of God and to stand tall as the love of my life, the one who has taught me more than any other human being. And she is anxiously preparing to build a new home in one of the over 2,000 vacant lots in our neighborhood in North Lawndale this summer. And I thank God for my wife, Ann. you that know my son Austin who was 12 who wanted to be here but we decided not to bring him he is still continuing to be busy following Grandpa Perkins and I around the country and traveling with us on many occasions and making sure that we do not say anything that isn't true <laughs> on one occasion Dr. Perkins was bragging about how 200 people came to hear us speak and, uh, and Austin corrected him as he often does me and says, Grandpa Perkins, I counted and there were only 61 in the audience. <laughs> so Austin continues with that. As for me, I can continued on my journey of being a pastor along with many others, actually six others helped me pastor Lawndale Community Church. Pastor Neely and Pastor Atkins and Pastor Jackson and uh, Pastor Holt and uh, am I, did I, and Pat, Pastor Ratliff. I knew I forgot somebody. As we continue there, I continue to work and do my best as the president of CCDA. And then I am finishing my Doctor of Ministry, de ministry degree at Eastern Baptist Seminary with only thing left to do is the finishing of writing of my dissertation, of which, of course, is the biggie. So pray for me as I hope to have that done by Christmas. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 4. I want to read one verse. I'm very tempted tonight to have a prayer and sit down. But I'm not, 
I cannot remember, as I've had the privilege all 10 years of addressing the CCDA membership and constituency, to ever have been burdened in the way that I am tonight. And so I am going to resist the temptation of just praying and sitting down, even though the night is late. Because I have a passion and I have a burden on my heart that I feel I must share with you. I will do my best to be brief. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is Jesus' coming out party in his home synagogue. The verse 17 says, The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. Jesus chose, he could have read anything in the book of Isaiah, he chose this particular passage, which is a quote of Isaiah 61. Reading verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Today our theme has been reconciliation and justice. We've spent quite a bit of time already talking about reconciliation. We've spent some time looking at some of the deeper issues of what reconciliation is all about. Our panel today, I think, took us to some new areas that we must look at and that we must think about. Tonight I want to talk about justice. Our sister Barbara helped us think some of it about justice as well as reconciliation and what must happen in our lives if reconciliation is going to take place. Barbara said that if reconciliation is going to take place, there must be justice. In American society, we have a history of injustice. We have injustices with Native Americans. The Native American story is such that we came to this land as Europeans and we stole their land and then we killed their brothers and sisters in a genocide of the Native Americans of this country. We have a Japanese, Chinese, Asian injustice in this nation where we put Asian people in camps just like almost the concentration camps that were happened in Nazi Germany. The African-American story, of course, is one of slavery, of going to another's country and stealing someone out of their very own country and bringing them across the land and across the ocean into our nation to serve our economic system. And racism and Jim Crow laws have continued in our country until today. The Latino challenge and the Latino injustices in our community have been rampant. In Chicago, we have places that will hire unlegal, undocumented people from other nations in the Latino community and pay them only a fraction of what it's worth. My wife Ann teaches ESL amongst Spanish-speaking people of our nation, and she has talked to the people and the men that are in her class tell her that they must work three jobs and live as three families in one apartment just to be able to hand it. In America, we have injustice. There's many injustices today that we could go on and talk about. The education system. Why is it that in the state of Illinois, New Trier in the richest area of Chicago is known as one of the best high schools in all of America, where in New Trier they spend $13,000 per pupil, but in the city of Chicago, in our public school system, we spend less than $6,000 per pupil in what is known as one of the worst public school systems in the nation the injustice of how we fund education. We have the injustice of the unborn child. We know, and many of us, and many of the evangelicals get so, so into that one issue, and it isn't a significant issue, the injustice that's done to unborn children in this nation, that they are not given a chance to even live on this great land. The broken treaties and promises of Native Americans. There's many injustices tonight, but I want to think about one with you tonight that is writing a new history. I'm very burdened that we are going to look back on the late 1990s and the early part of the 21st century, and people are going to be talking about what happened now as they talk about the Ku Klux Klan, as they talk about Nazi Germany, as they talk about the genocide of Native Americans. Because what's happening today is we're rewriting and we're writing history, and that is we're rewriting and writing, making history 
in our American criminal justice system. Barbara touched on it, John touched on it, but I want to talk about it in some detail. There are more African American men today than are in college. More African American men are in prison than are in college. 85% of all cane users in America, 85% of all cocaine users in America are white. And yet 85% of the people locked up for drug selling and drug peddling are Latino and African American men. One of every four black boys born in America today, in the statistics that we are living with, one of every four will end up in prison at one time in their life. We're killing men on skid row. We're killing men not only on skid row, but on death row. In Illinois, we have found 15 young men who were on death row waiting to be executed when we are thankful for the students at Northwestern University that decided to undercover and find out if these men really were guilty. And 15 men were found that they did not commit the crime that they were on death row to die on. Oh, we have a problem in the criminal justice system. The statistics are alarming and they're tragic. Within the last year, I've been to our local criminal courts more times than I want to tell you about. Representing and going and standing beside because the system says if a white man comes, puts on a tie, puts on a coat, and stands next to the young man of color, that there's a better chance that that young man might not go to jail. Oh, but I sat and I sat there in the courtroom and often my tears run down my cheeks because it's everybody in there of authority happens to be European American. And everybody that stands before the judge happens to be people of color. I see my Latino, my African American brothers standing before an all white criminal justice system with almost no chance for success. Oh, we passed a crime bill in America with three solutions, more prisons, more police, and midnight basketball. We've got a gym at Lawndale, but we don't have midnight basketball at Lawndale. We tell our young men to go home, be with your family at midnight, go to sleep, get up tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, and go to work, not to play basketball all night. The prisons are not the solutions to crime. They only feed the economic system of prisons. Prisons are big business. I want to quickly tell you about it. It's a 30, a $30 billion business in America. The small towns are now competing to get prisons, to revive the local economies. The rail towns are turning into jail towns. I lived and I grew up in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and I remember as a little boy, there wanted to be a prison in my town, and the community fought it and said, no, we don't want a prison in our community. Today, there's a prison in my hometown because they fought to get a prison because it brought jobs to the neighborhood. The Cor Corrections Corporation of America is the 67th fastest growing small business in America. If you invested $10,000 in stock three years ago, $10,000, your investment would today be worth $74,000. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, the criminal justice system is big business today. At the same time, from 1985 to 1995, the number of African Americans incarcerated through drugs has risen 700 percent. We're building 1,000 beds a week for new prisons. In Illinois alone, let me tell you what we've done. 1989, Western Illinois Correctional Center, $41 million. 1989, Illinois River Correction Center, $41 million. 1990, Taylor Correctional Center, $24 million. 1991, Robertson Correctional Center, $25 million. 1993, Illinois Muddy, Water, Muddy Rivers uh, Correctional Center, $48 million. 1995, Southwestern Illinois Correctional Center, $20 million. 1999, Pickeyville Correctional Center, $73 million. And in the year 2000, a Kankakee prison that cost $83 million. That's just in Illinois. $41 million is the average cost to build a prison. It brings 200 construction jobs and 400 permanent jobs. It pumps $10 million a year into the local economy. Let's remember another point of history. It was called the peculiar institution, slavery in America. 
Slavery, of course, we rarely talk about the major contribution to the American economy 200 years and more ago. You see, the slave economy allowed America to grow economically, and we grew on the backs of the slaves of this nation. Now prisons and the prison system, again, are becoming big business. 1980, the education budget in America was $27 billion, and the prison budget was $8 billion. Almost anybody with any sense at all knows that education is an important answer. If you listen to Gore and Bush, both of them, all they, they both tried to convince us that they were education presidents. In 1995, education dropped from $27 billion to $16 billion, and the prisons increased from $8 billion to $20 billion. Where your money is, there will your heart be also. We spend anywhere between $35,000 to $50,000 to keep one person in prison for one year when we spend somewhere between four dollars and $10,000 to educate. America has the largest prison population in the whole world. Two million people are in prison as we're here tonight. A million of them are black men. Somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of, the of, the, of, of that other million are Latinos. The prison population has increased 50 percent. Now let me tell you, I want to read to you an African-American pastor's comments. He's a pastor of a Baptist church in Evanston. He was asked the question, what's the most important issue facing the black church in the new millennium? This is Dr. Taylor, Heisel Taylor. Black ministers especially must begin to see the incar incar incarceration of African Americans as an insidious and seductive movement of genocide more sophisticated and sadistic than the genocide against Jews in Germany. It is a genocide that warehouses black bodies rather than exterminates them. It then exterminates black spirits through the torture of isolation and socialization and sexual perversion and indoctrination into crime. Black ministers, we must see that in order to maintain a thriving prison industry, there must be crime. In order to have crime, criminals must be created. In order to create criminals, a context for crime must be created, which if the reason for poverty, drugs, guns, and the instigation, particularly of religion, but also social and political divisiveness in the black community. We need to see and understand that we're making and writing history today and it's going to have a huge effect on our nation. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do if he was alive today? We all wear the bracelets WWJD. We have them on our hats. We wear a bracelet. We have them on banners. What would Jesus do today? Well, I think Jesus would be reminding us of the passage here, of proclaiming good news to the poor. You see, we need to talk about justice at the same breath that we talk about righteousness. So many of us are so righteous and we work at worshiping God and we work so hard at that, but we have left out justice. 64 times in the Old Testament when the word righteousness is used, the same verse the word justice is used. They go hand in hand. The great commandment in the Bible is to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Loving God, righteousness. Loving your neighbor, justice. We must work for justice. I'm going to give you four points, and I'll sit down. What can we do? What are we to do if we're going to be like Christ? Christ was committed, as it says in Luke chapter 4, he was committed to the prisoners. He was committed to the oppressed. He was committed to the poor. This is Jesus' mission statement. The first thing we must do is we must work for justice. There was a pastor in Chicago who was in a courtroom, and as he watched, this happened to be a housing court, and as he watched over and over and over again, all of the slum landlords be able to go through in front of the judge and come out in, with, with everything intact, and the poor tenants had absolutely no rights. Finally, this pastor could contain himself so mo no more, and he stood up in the courtroom and he said, Your Honor, why is there no justice in this courtroom? Where is the justice? The judge looked at him very quietly and he said, Reverend, 
This is not a court of justice. This is a court of law. If you want justice, you need to change the laws. We must work to change the laws. We must work to change the laws that if you are caught with a little bit of crack cocaine, you go to prison for seven years, and yet you might be caught with a whole kilo of, of pure cocaine and not go to prison at all because it's aimed at the African-American community to stop that. We must stop those kinds of laws. We must change those laws. We must be involved in justice issues. We must speak out. We must talk to our elected officials. We must come to them and understand the meetings and and we must get ourselves at the table and quit letting other people be at the table to decide what is right. When we hear about it, we must get involved. The second thing we must do is we must love the existing prisoners. Every church has absolutely no option. We must have a prison ministry. We must begin to go into the prisons and to love the prisoners that are there. We must be there. We must share our love with them. We must visit them. We must let them call us at our church or at home, collect because they can't put money in the pay phone. We must be there for them and we must love their families while they're there. You figure out how to do it, but we must do it. Thirdly, we must help those coming out of prisons to succeed. At Lawndale, you want to know what makes Lawndale today is we got a little ministry called Hope House for Men. You see, Hope House is for two kinds of men. It's for men who are strung out on the streets on drugs or alcohol, just can't, are just out there, and, but they think maybe they can get it. They want to get a little help. Or for men just getting out of prison. It actually serves two purposes. We're helping these men not to end up in prison, and then when the new people come out of prison, we bring them into a loving home. We have 27 men that live together for nine months in our Hope House. The other day we were in a meeting in our neighborhood and the meeting was all about all the crime and we've been having a lot of crime in our neighborhood. We've been having a gang war and there's been several murders in our community and, and, and it's been terrible. It's really been terrible. The killings that have been going on in the last six weeks in North Lawndale have been a tragedy. So we had a community meeting at it. And the whole community was invited. 60,000 people were invited to a meeting and 240 showed up. The alderman was there. Every television, all seven networks in Chicago were there with their television cameras. Now out of those 140, 240, about 160 were members of Lawndale Community Church. We did take over the meeting. But I'll, the way it happened was there was a young man in our Hope House that had come through our Hope House ministry. He stood up and everybody was talking about the gangbangers and how bad they are. We got to lock up these guys and throw him into prison. He said, you know what? Two years ago, I was on that street corner and I was selling drugs. Two years ago, I was a gangbanger. Two years ago, I was strung out on drugs myself. But I came on by Lawndale Community Church. I got myself in Hope House and I turned my life over to Jesus Christ and I haven't used drugs for two years. I got a good job and I have my own apartment and I'm doing quite well. That's what we need to do. When I meet with the police of our community, I tell them, I do not, I do not, I do not want you to lock up boys on the street corners in my neighborhood. You see something going on there, you call our church. We will come out there. We will be on the street corner because the answer is not going on the corner and locking boys up and putting them in jail. I don't want anybody to go to jail. I think our prisons do absolutely nothing good for the young people who are in them. Absolutely no good. We've got to help job training. Mary Nelson says that one of the things that when she was out talking to the drug dealers in her corners, that they said, yeah, but I need a job. They don't just want prayer, they want a job. We've got to create jobs. We've got to work for jobs. We've got to treat the people on those corners with love and dignity. We've got to love them unconditionally with the love of Jesus Christ. Lastly, we must 
use the old economic theory of supply and demand and apply it to this economic force, which means we must stop the supply of young Latino, African-American men for this economic system pumping $10 billion into an economy. How do we do that? We do that by coming alongside the at-risk people that are there. We need to not, as Barbara said so beautifully, be afraid to go into the public schools and to begin to love the people that are there. We have three public schools in our neighborhood that every day in the morning when the kids go to school, we have six to eight men on the street corner so that they can get in there safely. And when they come out, they're there on the corner again and they're loving them, they're talking to the kids, they're getting to know the kids. These kids are looking up to these men. They're seeing African-American men who wanna make a difference in life. They're beginning to change. We need to help our young men to have a changed heart through Jesus Christ. We need to educate them. We need to educate them that crime does not pay. We also need to help them understand how the system works.